Is it on? Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Buenos días a los que hablan español especialmente. La próxima sesión se va a interpretar del inglés al español. Si necesita un aparato, solo hay que salir a la entrada y ahí lo puede recoger. And what I'm saying is basically, if you need interpreting from English to Spanish, there are the um, uh, transmitters out here at the main door. So, eh, solo pase a recogerlo y puede escuchar esta presentación en español. Aquí en, están aquí a la entrada. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How is everybody? Did you sleep well? Did you go to a, how many people went to a session this morning? Did anybody skip their session this morning? You don't have to raise your hand on that one. Um, it's, it's been a wonderful weekend. Um, I know there have been a couple of logistical bumps, and so the folks wanted me to apologize to those of you that got stuck in the very long food truck line yesterday. Um, we apologize, we're grateful for your patience, and there will be two food trucks today to help expedite that process. And if you prepaid for the tickets for the, the taco food, the taco bar food truck, it's a lot of words, the taco bar food truck will be ready to serve lunch at 11, and it will stay open till 1.30. Now, you're not going to want to bust out of here because we've got a great keynote this morning, but it will open at 11, and it will stay open till 1.30. And then there will be a second Jimmy's Famous Seafood food truck. I'm a little partial to Louisiana seafood, but I've heard it's good, so give it a try. Um, but it also opens at 11. But if you don't want seafood, there's a Jimmy John's, there's a Subway, there's a Chipotle, just don't have the guacamole, and Starbucks, and, and you, can, you can get yourself um, some lunch. How many people have heard something profound this weekend that's really challenged them? I'm going to youth minister you for a second. How many people have actually heard something that maybe pushed them uh, kind of to the edge of their comfort ministry? The edge of your comfort zone. Yeah, I want you to turn to the person next to you. Say good morning to them. There you go. Stare deeply into their eyes for just a second. Not in a creepy way, just in a, a good morning way. There you go. Tell them they're the most beautiful eyes you've seen all day. A couple of men are giving me hateful looks right now. That's okay. You'll never see me again after this. It's fine. Maybe never see them again either. And I want you to just share with the person next to you very quickly, just very, very briefly, 30 seconds or less for each of you, one thing this weekend that has challenged you. One thing that you've heard this weekend that has challenged you in your ministry, in your own spiritual journey, uh, maybe in your, in your just personal life, one thing that's challenged you, 30 seconds, ready, go. Just a few more seconds. Start to wrap up your answer. I'm going to pull an old youth ministry trick. Clap once if you can hear me. Clap twice if you can hear me. <clears throat> I can't hear myself, sorry. 
<clears throat> there we go. We came together to unpack and explore this concept of prophetic discipleship in our homes, in our parishes, and in our world. And somebody asked me last night, so are we like out of the missionary discipleship thing? Like are we now on to like prophetic discipleship? Like is that the next thing? And so I don't think that the words are that different, right? Missionaries are those who go out and prophets are those who don't shut up. And I think the two things are necessary together. But on top of that, I think all of us this weekend have, hopefully, I know I have, um, been pushed and challenged to ask ourselves really important questions. Really important questions about where are my priorities? Sister Miriam challenged us yesterday morning with that. Or Deacon Oni, who fired us all up if you were here on, on uh, Thursday, was that Thursday? Yeah, Thursday evening. Um, firing us all up to, to be unafraid to be the kind of Catholics that raise our arms, to not be the sourpuss Catholics that were baptized in lemon juice. I, I, think, I think all the different workshops that have gotten very practical and very specific have, have forced us to ask the right questions. And sometimes as Catholics, and I'm going to be the first to say I'm the one that does this, I don't like to ask questions because I don't want anything to change. Because like, I like the way my system is, my structure is, I want my calendar to be organized, I want the system to be in place. It's worked before, let's let it continue working. If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like That's, I think, a lot of our ministry mentalities in the work that we do. But when we ask really good questions and we push that envelope and we dare to do something different in our homes and in our world and in our church, to be those kinds of people that speak up and go forth, which is what prophetic discipleship is about, incredible things can happen. Um, I'm, I'm a millennial. I was born in 1989. I own it. Um, th thank you for applauding 1989. There we go. It's a good year. Thanks so much. Um, I was born in 1989. I never let certain people forget that they could be old enough to be my father or my mother. And as a millennial, my generation's all screwed up. We're not getting married. We like avocado toast. We don't buy houses. The whole nine yards. I enjoy avocado toast, but am married, have a kid, and have a house. So I don't necessarily fall into those categories. Um, but as a millennial, I'm attached to my phone. I, highly, I happily admit that. I love to text. I love to text GIFs. I love to tweet. I love to fight with people on Twitter. I love to post pictures of my kid all over the place and make sure everybody thinks she's cute. But I'm fascinated by the fact that it's so second nature to me, just in the past couple years. Like the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is pull up my phone and check all of my different apps. And that hasn't always been how we are in this world. That, that wasn't always the norm. In the early 2000s, there were these two guys in Silicon Valley, like the hellscape of America, and um, they had developed this app that they thought was going to change the world. It was called Bourbon, B-U-R-B-N, not the drink, the app. And it was this app, it was a check-in app. So like people could download bourbon on their phone and they could check in to like a coffee shop or a bar or a restaurant. They'd check in and then they'd take a picture of like their food or their drink or the barista or the person they were with and then they'd give like a quick little summary of like where they were. Like this barista gave me extra foam on my chai tea latte, five stars, something like that. So it was like Yelp on your phone with pictures and captions and check-ins. And they had like 3,000 people sign up for it and they start looking for more people to give money because they want to develop it further and buy more further space, server space. Like they want to grow this app, but people aren't signing up and they're not getting investors and they can't figure out why. And so they meet with this investor. This guy walks in. He's like prepared to write them a quarter million dollar check because he likes the idea. And he sits down with Kevin and Mike and he starts asking them all these questions about the app and what works and what are their demographics and show me your whole spec sheet. And they're pulling out all their different papers to show them their projections. And then Mike says, but we just, we can't figure out why people aren't signing up. And the angel investor looks up at the guys and he goes, guys, you're asking the wrong question. You're asking why people aren't using this as opposed to asking the people that are using it why they like it. You've got to flip the question. So Kevin and Mike go back to their apartment later that night. They pull out these whiteboards because, you know, they're developer guys and they have whiteboards in their living room and they start, <laughs> they start coding all this new stuff and they start texting all the people that they know are using this app and they start saying, what do you like about it? Why do you like this bourbon app? Why'd you sign up? Why are you using it? Because the demographics showed that once people started using it, they liked it, but they needed to figure out how to get people to sign up for it. So they asked the right question. Why do people like this particular app over a Facebook or a Twitter? And they found that people really liked being able to share the pictures. At the time, back in the dark ages of social media, you used to have to upload a picture on your computer desktop to Facebook. Twitter didn't really have the functions for photos, but Bourbon lets you show a picture that was just sitting on your brand new iPhone that you'd taken this, this photo and you didn't know what to do with it. 
So they sit down and they start thinking, okay, so the instant sharing of photographs, almost like this visual telegram, maybe we should completely recreate it and bourbon becomes Instagram. They had thousands and thousands upon thousands of people sign up, a million users in the first three months once they recraft it. To this day, there's over 500 million users on Instagram with 94 million photos shared a day. There's not that much stuff to look at in the world, but we all share it all the time. <laughs> And they create this thing that some of us can't even live without, myself included, because they asked the right question and then therefore changed literally the fabric of society and the way we communicate with one another. Half the baby products in my house were purchased because of an ad on Instagram. I met my husband through Facebook, so we know social media works in that regard. But like, they literally changed the game because they asked the right question. And then they improved upon that user experience. Kevin has a little bit of a mental breakdown. He goes on vacation with his wife, and his wife shares with him, oh, I like Instagram, but my pictures never really look good. And so he figures out that the reason people weren't necessarily sharing all the time was because their pictures didn't look good enough, so he makes the first filter. So now we can like, make all of our photos look fake. But he, he improved upon the experience so that people would use it more. Now, I'm not trying to Silicon Valley our church. I'm not saying prophetic discipleship is just about like, finding a magic bullet to fix all of our church's problems, because I don't think that's going to work. But I do think if everybody in this room committed to going back to their parishes and their communities, their schools, even their families, and asked the right question, but how can I be a better prophetic disciple? How can I better serve the men and women I encounter every single day? How can I serve within my home? How can I challenge people within our church? How can I influence this world? That's the kind of church I want my daughter to grow up in. That's the kind of church that I think all of us want to be part of, the church that asks the right questions. And I think that starts with especially going to young people and looking them square in the eye, the young people that are passionate about their faith, the young people that show up voluntarily, the young people that were forced to come to the retreat and enjoyed it by the end of the weekend, and say, why do you love being Catholic? What about this church gets you excited? Why do you love Jesus Christ? Instead of fretting about why aren't they here and why are our churches closing and why are the tithings down? Let's ask the right question about why people love it and do that better. I think that's prophetic discipleship in a nutshell. And we're going to finally unpack that with one of my favorite people on the face of the planet, um, a priest that most of us know from our Facebook feeds. Um, and the classic line, this is Father Mike Schmitz, and this is Ascension Presents. <laughs> and, and we know him as a man that shares his heart, that inspires, that teaches, I first had the pleasure of meeting him at a Steubenville conference. We served on a team together, and I was like super, like fangirling, like I did with Sister Miriam yesterday, like, oh my gosh, this is Father Mike Schmitz. And he was the, the coolest guy. Like, wanted to talk about TV shows and share stories about the students that he gets to work with at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And he's a director of youth and young adult ministry in his diocese, so he's boots on the ground doing this work with young people every single day. So he's not just a guy from a screen, he's an incredible priest. And let's give a warm welcome to Father Mike Schmitz. And we're going to do as we did with all of our presenters. We're going to pray for you. Is that okay? Um, so if, let's put our phones down for just a second. Let's enter into a space of prayer. You can get your selfie later. And let's extend our hands in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we ask that you fill this place with your presence. We ask that you give Father Mike Schmitz your words. We ask that you give him comfort and confidence. Mother Mary, we ask that you wrap him in your mantle. And Holy Spirit, be his advocate and guide. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father Mike Schmitz. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. A uh, couple quick things. One is, I'm really tempted to just be like, so everybody. <laughs> I don't feel like standing. Um, which actually is really nice. <laughs> Dang it. I wish I wouldn't have sat down. So I'm going to stand up in a second. But I have a first, I have first I have a question. I'm going to stand up right now. Um, I have a, so one thing, I just want to thank you all for being here because I know that there are other places you could be. Um, so just keep that. I just want to thank you. Uh, without anything else, because I w have a tendency to go on and on and on. Uh, I want to invite you to... Turn to this person sitting next to you, and if you can answer this question. 
Um, if you could be anywhere, anywhere in the world right now, doing anything in the world right now, where would you be and what would you be doing? Okay, so just like, if you could be anywhere in the world right now, doing anything in the world right now, where would you be, what would you be doing? Ready, go. All right, I, I, I don't know how many of you got a chance to answer, both of you, but could anyone mind uh, just kind of raising your hand and, and just, yes. S-E-C? A C-C, sorry. The, the, <laughs> the collegiate conference, the S-E-C? Um, she said a C-C, which is in Italy, I think. Um, just, uh, what would you be doing in a C-C? Awesome. So walking in the town, village of Assisi, praying with St. Francis. Awesome. The great answer. Yeah. Having a cappuccino Alfredo? Ca cappuccino Alfredo. I'm like, wow, that sounds like a, a kind of fusion I've never experienced before. <laughs> cappuccino Alfredo. Um, cappuccino Alfredo with Pope Francis um, in Rome, maybe? Yeah, why not? He's there. Uh, yeah, a quest, quick question for y'all. Uh, this is uh, just trivia. How many bowls of fettuccine Alfredo do you need to eat in order to equal the fat content of 16 strips of bacon? Guess, okay, how many bowls of fettuccine Alfredo do you have to eat to add, yeah, the fat content of 16 strips of bacon? Yes, you're right. One, one. So there you go. Enjoy not enjoying fettuccine Alfredo ever again. Uh, any, any, anyone else? Uh, where would you be? What would you be doing? Yes. Uh, so, partial nerd, she said here, but with her husband and with her kids. So that's that's great. So yes, sitting on, sitting on the edge. Any any ocean? Which ocean? Sitting on the edge of a warm ocean. Awesome. <laughs> so not the North Atlantic. Anyone else over in this section? Yes. Wonderful. I'm glad there are other nerds as well. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, you know, it's funny because out of all the answers you could give, um, I could probably say with reasonable certainty, I already know what 97% of y'all's answers are going to be. I mean, I already are, with, before you can walk into this room, that um, I could probably guarantee with 97% certainty what every single person would say, where you would want to be and what you would want to be doing. And that answer is somewhere else doing something else. <laughs> Except for <laughs> the 3% who, um, <laughs> but, but there's this, the bit, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing. Um, but honestly, this is, this is, that's typically the answer, is if you could be anywhere in the world, where would you be? What would you be doing? And almost always, I mean, think about this, not just on a Saturday, mo sat is a Saturday, not just on a Saturday morning, but if someone walked up to you at work and said, hey, if you could be anywhere in the world right now, doing anything in the world right now, where would you be? What would you be doing? The answer is almost always somewhere else, doing something else. If you would sit stuck in traffic, where would you, where would you want to be? Somewhere else, doing something else. If you were... Any time someone would walk up to you and said, actually, right now, I have the ability to give this gift to you. You could be anywhere in the world, doing anything in the world. Where would you be? What would you be doing? Almost always, we have this consistent answer. And that answer is, I would rather be somewhere else doing something else. And I have to ask the question, what does that do to us? If at any given moment in our lives, I would rather be somewhere else than I am now, doing something else that I'm doing right now. That's, how, that's where we live. And think about, um, 
that's one of the reasons why, as, as Katie mentioned, you know, we have these apps and we have this distraction. We have this, you know, um, when it comes to our phone, our device, the thing right in front of us, what does that do to us? It gives us the chance to escape this moment and to escape this place, to escape this thing. Because why? Because I'd rather be somewhere else doing something else. And so here's an interesting thing. Uh, rather than actually change the thing I'm doing, I just numb myself or distract myself from the thing I'm doing. I once heard a, a pastor say that his grandma uh, once told him that never say anything that you couldn't finish with the words and I wouldn't have it any other way. Like never say anything but you couldn't finish with the words and I wouldn't have it any other, any other way. And I think about this when it comes to our, like, our students, like my, some of my college students at, on campus, like, oh, I just... I totally just got sucked into Netflix all day Saturday. That's all I did. And I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> or like, oh my gosh, I'm just so, so busy. I have so much stuff to do. And I wouldn't have it any other way. We could all say this. Like, I'm just so just like bogged down with work and, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I just, there's no time for family and I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm just, I'm just so um, stressed out about X and I wouldn't have it any other way. That we realize, we recognize that it's, there are so many areas of our life where we would have it some other way, but we're not willing to change it. I mean, kind of a hard truth, I think it's true. Not always, but often, we are the cause of our own misery. Obviously, not always, obviously, right? I and mean, that's not always the case. There is sickness that we didn't choose, and there's relationships that end that we didn't choose for them to end. There's things that have happened in our lives that we didn't choose. But oftentimes, we are the cause of our own misery. Because rather than saying, you know, I'd rather be somewhere else doing something else, and rather than doing something about that, again, what do we do? We just distract ourselves. We numb ourselves. We don't take action on this because rather than actually doing something, you know, it, one of the reasons why we don't change is because the pain it takes to stay the same is less than the pain it takes to change. And none of us will ever change until the pain it takes to stay the same outweighs the pain it takes to change. But we'll never actually experience that good, good pain that motivates us to move as long as we keep numbing ourselves. And as long as we keep distracting ourselves. So what's the price? What's the price of constant distraction? Well, there's many prices. Let me go through them. <laughs> one of the prices of constant distraction, we know this one. I'm going to start with the easiest one, the lowest one, the, the, um, the one that maybe and ultimately costs us the least is we cease to be productive. Like when it comes to our constant distraction, we cease to be productive. There's a man, his name is Cal Newport. He wrote a book called The Deep Work. Cal Newport is, he is a professor at Georgetown University and he teaches com some kind of computer science. He's experimental computer science and he's written a number of best-selling books and he doesn't have a social media account. And he, he says, people in my field, like, you know, I live and breathe computers and people in my field can't understand how in the world can you work with computers and not have a social media account? How in the world can you be a best-selling author and not have a social media account? And he points this out. He says, because a lot of times parents will say about their own child, they, well, they need to have the, the cell phone because they, I don't want to hold them back from, from being you know, a native user of whatever technology there is. He points out the fact that if what you can do, what, what an adult can do on their cell phone, like I really know how to use this thing. If what you can do with your cell phone is the same thing that a six-year-old can do on the cell phone, what you can do on your cell phone has no value. <laughs> Someone feels very validated. <laughs> That's right, I don't know how to take a photo either. Um, no, I'm just teasing. But, but honestly, there is, there is that's something true, and he, what he goes on to, to make, make, the, make the point of saying, um, if you want to actually make a contribution, not like just to the world, but to the people around you, that's going to involve not doing what everyone else can do, but doing what only you can do. Not doing what everyone else can do on their cell phone or on their tablet or on their computer, but doing what only you can do. 
And yet, how often are we in a moment where we could like even just be with our own thoughts and we choose instead to distract ourselves? How often are we on a deadline and we're like, okay, I have to get this work done, but I'm just going to check my email quick. Or I have all this work to do, but I'm just going to, how many, okay, confession time. How many people work on a daily basis with, with, your, with your computer? Okay, keep them up if this is true. How many of you work with the internet on a regular basis? Okay. How many of you know how to open up multiple tabs? How many of you, maybe currently or at least during the workday, have more than five tabs open on your computer? How many have more than 10 tabs open on your computer? How many have more than 20 tabs open on your computer? How many have roughly 25 tabs? So notice my hand is up. Because one of the reasons we preachers preach is because we realize, like, I look in the mirror and go, you're a loser. You need Jesus. <laughs> so this is the thing. Is Cal Newport points out that they've done research, they've done some studies on that little break that we, what we take to kind of ch- go from this tab to that tab to this tab to that tab. Like, oh, I just want to read this quick. I'm just going to look at this. I'm just going to check my email. Do you know if you're in the midst of deep work, if you're in the midst of what Cal Newport calls deep work, you take a moment, you get a little ping, like, oh, the email came in. And you just look at it. It takes 20 minutes to get back to that place of deep work. Like, I just glanced over it, just like, oh, okay, just registered. I didn't do anything about it. I didn't respond. I didn't. I just was distracted enough to take myself out of this state of deep work, deep work. And now it takes 20 minutes to get back to that place where I have focused concentration. It costs us something. And when it doesn't, you know, you could look at it from terms of uh, productivity. We could also look at it in terms of just like making an impact because what your work is is significant. Like the, the thoughts you have about when you think deeply about something when it comes to God, when it comes to your relationships, when it comes to life, it's like that's really significant. But if I'm constantly scattering my thoughts, if I'm constantly removing myself from this place of depth, then not only... This is the important thing. Not only is it more difficult to, be, go, to go deep, I could render myself incapable of going deep. What I mean by that is there's a man who wrote a book called The Shallows, um, subtitled How the Internet is Rewiring Our Brain. And one of the points he makes in, in the course of his book is that when we have the, we find it's difficult to focus, difficult to concentrate. It's not just a, At first, it's a temporary thing. It can become a permanent thing. Where I'm not just, I just can't focus this afternoon. It's like, no, I have trained my brain to be incapable of focus. So the cost is really high. Like, the personal cost is really, really high. Because I don't think anyone here wants to be the kind of person who can't, like, do deep work, who can't think deep thoughts, the kind of person who, who can't focus even more than that, I don't think any of us want to be the kind of person who can't be alone with our own thoughts for more than 30 seconds. I might have been Blaise Pascal who said that um, the source of all humanity's problems is our inability to sit by ourselves alone for one hour in a quiet room. I can't stand in a line waiting for the plane to board without pulling out the phone like, what's new? (laughs) Isn't it funny we call it news? but it's supposed to be also important. It's not importance, the importance paper. It's just the newspaper. So people say like, well, no, I need to have that constant uh, connection with, with, with the internet. I need that constant connection with what's going on because I need to know the news. Listen, if it's something you need to know, you'll find out. <laughs> Otherwise, the only reason it's there is because it's new. Not because it's important. Again, we would call it the importance paper, the importance caster. It's just the newscaster or the newspaper. It's one of the crazy things. Well, no, I need to be connected on social media because I need to like share stuff and my thoughts and again my tiramisu uh, photos. Like, and just recognizing it's 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 a great dash to humility to recognize that nobody cares what you think. It's true. Nobody cares what I think. In 140 characters or times two right now, 
Nobody cares. And if they do, they need to get a life. <laughs> when it comes to that, that kind of life where we're constantly distracting ourselves, constantly going up to the shallows, it robs life of its depth, not just our lives of, a product, of its productivity. It also costs us so much in terms of relationships. Again, I'm just, this is stuff that you might know already, but I think it's worth noting. What is the relational cost of constantly being distracted? I mean, you've seen it, you've, you've seen it happen. Uh, I, remember, I remember the first time I ever really, really saw it and really observed it and went, huh, that's not how it should be. We were, I was out with a bunch of youth ministers. We had a youth minister retreat, and we took a break at the end of the retreat to go out to dinner. And um, this couple came in. They were clearly on a date. Well, actually, and I don't know clearly on a date. It was a guy and a girl. They're roughly the same age, and they didn't look like they were related. Um, what didn't look like they were on a date to eat food together, right, they, what, is that they both sat down and hardly looked up, but they were just looking at each, sitting across from each other, just looking at their phones. And we looked, I looked over, and I'm like, I think they're on a date. They have not communicated. They might occasionally go, huh, hey, look, and then go back to the thing. Like, oh, that's nice. What is the interpersonal cost? No, it doesn't have to be necessarily overly deep. Let's just look back to your own relationships. How many conflicts have you had, if you're, if you're married or in any kind of significant relationship with anybody, how many conflicts have you had that could have completely been avoided if you had just been willing to put down whatever you were on or were able to even just look your way from the screen? Um, this is, this is this, my mom and dad just celebrated 51 years of marriage last December, and um, I will let them know that you're very happy. I'm very proud of them as well. They are the best fighters I've ever met in my entire life. <laughs> they, no, not just because they're not, they're not good at it. They can make a fight out of anything. <laughs> you think like, no, they could make a fight out of anything. They can make a fight out of anything. This is literally, I remember my mom saying to my dad, hey, have you fed the dog today? And he says, no, I didn't feed the dog today. She, and she said, wait, wait, you said you, you fed the dog? No, I said I didn't feed the dog. Wonderful, thanks. Clarified. That's the end of a, normal human beings, that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> but not incredibly gifted human beings like my parents. Because they were able to take that conversation and make a fight out of it. Like, oh, well, I, I thought you said you fed the dog. Like, no, 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 I said I didn't feed the dog. Okay, but well, I thought you said you fed the dog. But I, did, I said I didn't feed the dog. Okay, I get it. But I thought you said you fed the dog. Like, you guys, I want to have like a striped black and white shirt and just have, blow a whistle and say, okay, jump ball. Like, that's it. But one of the re ways my parents uh, have their fights is they refuse, after, even after 51 years, when they know that his hearing is getting worse by the moment. <laughs> that my mom still insists doing the same thing, where she'll say, from the other room, Peter, could you... <laughs> what? <laughs> Rather than like, okay, I'm going to get up, I'll walk into the other room and say... Peter, would you do the thing of the thing? Thank you for coming in, making eye contact with me, speaking in a way I can understand. Of course I'll do the thing for you. I love you. But how often do we just have that sense of like, I don't have your attention. You're not really present here. But I'm just going to kind of call out. I just got banana. I remember there was a, uh, no, that's 51 years, old dogs, new tricks, I don't know if it's going to get any better. A hearing aid would help. <laughs> but there was a couple I was helping for, mar for marriage prep, and they caught on. He was a computer programming major, and so worked on computers all day, and he lived, or he would prefer to live on computers the rest of the day as well. And so they described a moment to me where she came to his house and he was on the computer. And he's like, hi, how's it going? He's still on the computer playing his game or doing his thing. And she starts talking about her day and he's like, oh yeah, wow. And he's, he's like verbally affirming all these things she's saying. Like, yeah, that's neat, that's neat, that's neat. And at one point, she's talking, telling more about her day and he gets up and goes into the kitchen. And she stopped, yeah. <laughs> he's like, oh wow, wow, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And she stopped talking, and he's in the kitchen like, no, go ahead, keep talking. She's like, silent. You can keep talking. 
comes out, what's wrong? And she told him what was wrong. <laughs> it was a relatively large fight that they had. But the great news is, <laughs> unlike certain other couples who shall kind of sort of remain nameless, I'll just call them mom and dad. <laughs> they learned and they came up with a strategy and the strategy was this, whenever we see each other at the end of the day, we get at least 15 minutes of eyeball time. That's it, we just give each other 15 minutes of eyeball time. That yep, I know you like your computer thing and I know I've got all these things to do and I, we, have, we have so many things to do. But when it comes to this moment where we get to reconnect at the end of the day, we get 15 minutes of eyeball time. Those of you who are in a significant relationship, maybe that has some bad habits. How different would your relationship be if on a regular basis you just had simply 15 minutes of eyeball time? How different would your relationship be? Like this is even like, doesn't have to be 15 minutes. How different would your relationship be? Like, We're so busy, are you kidding me? Come home and like just sit down and talk to each other. Do you have any idea how many kids or how many other things there are to do? Okay, I got it. How about at the end of the day, before you collapse into bed, to just have five minutes where, I mean, just think about this. Think about this would be, what this would be like with your husband or your wife. If at the end of the day, for at least five minutes before you fell into bed, you just stood at the foot of your bed, held each other by the hands, and just looked each other in the eye. And if you had something to say, you said it. If someone was saying what they were saying, you listened to it. Or you just simply looked at each other and held hands, looking at each other for five minutes before you fell asleep. How significantly different would your relationship be? But we're, what would that be like? I'm standing here, I'm, I'm thinking all about what? I'd rather be somewhere else doing something else. Or I just need to be somewhere else doing something else. That's one of the, one of the reasons why I think the price of relationships, the cost of relationships when it comes down to uh, this this whole thing is it's not just about like, well, we, did, we had a fight because I didn't, wasn't really listening. I was looking at the screen. It's even greater than that. What is the message that I'm communicating to my spouse on a regular basis is I'd rather be somewhere other than with you doing something other than what I'm doing with you. That's one of the reasons why my phone is right. My watch is telling me something. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> this is Dick Tracy. I, uh, if I ever tried that in college, they would have no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> I appreciate all of you very much. I don't want to be anywhere else right than right now <laughs> with you people. So it costs us. It costs us when it comes to our work and deep thinking and it comes to be even just being okay with being ourselves, being in this place. It costs us relationships but it's just taken for granted right now. I was sharing this morning at, at, at breakfast uh, with some folks from The Word Among Us uh, about how uh, I, I have a coordinator on our campus. Uh, her name is Heather, and, and some of the students were like, Heather, uh, Christmas time, we want to uh, come over to your, uh, your house and have like a Hallmark Christmas movie marathon. And Heather's like, absolutely, I want that as well. So a bunch of girls came over to her house, and they're all sitting there on the couch, and I was like, Heather, the next day, I said, how, how'd it go? She said, well, um, Two girls fell asleep right away. And the other three or four, the whole time, we were watching the movie together. They were on their phones. And it was kind of one of those situations of like, well, just can you, the, the, the movie, you, remember you came over to my house to watch the movies? And just, no, I mean, hey, I'm watching. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm watching. Now, here's the in interesting thing, is sometimes when it comes to these kinds of social media stuff or like the distraction stuff, it's really easy to point to the younger generation. But that's because they're the canary in the coal mine. Like the impact of constant distraction is more readily apparent in them than it is necessarily for adults. But it doesn't just go down. Realize this, this reach of distraction goes up as well. 
because as I c confessed to the people at, at breakfast this morning is um, there are times when like, I, I want to, someone recommends a TV show. I'm like, oh, that sounds like a really interesting, you know, compelling story, really well done. I'd like to take a look at it. I'd like to check it out. But I don't have time to like, sit down and watch something. Like just, just enjoy life, you know, to choose on purpose to do something and not be distracted. So what I'll do instead is I'll go to an episode of a show that I've seen 40 times. Why? Because I want to be able to have it on in the background, but be able to do something else at the same time. And I'm 44 years old, not a millennial. Praise the Lord. Just, just, kidding. just kidding. Generation X is the best, said no one. <laughs> but that's the thing is it affects all of us. It continues like, to, to spread throughout where we're at. So a distraction is what? I want to do this, but I also want to do this. A distraction is anything that takes us away or takes our attention away from what we ought to be doing at any given moment. Distraction is anything that takes our attention away from anything we, whatever we ought to be doing at any given moment. So if that thing is, I want to enjoy a movie. I want to enjoy this streaming entertainment. I want, I want to enjoy this meal. I want to enjoy looking at my spouse's eyes before we fall asleep. I have to quick stop what I'm doing and take care of my child because that's what I should be doing right now. That's not a distraction. That's now what I should be doing. So distraction is anything that takes my attention away from what I should be doing at any given moment. But in order to know what I should be doing at any given moment, I have to make some decisions. What should I be doing? I ask some questions. What should I be doing at this moment? And then to choose. It's very difficult a lot of times, though, for us to make that decision when we're constantly distracted. So what's the answer? I don't know. Have a great night, you guys. I appreciate... <laughs> There's this ancient, uh, you know, it goes, actually goes back as far as Christianity, but there was, there was a, a, a monk who recognized, he discovered this thing. Well, he didn't discover it. He just kind of, re, his brothers re-popularized what he had discovered, which was the practice of the presence of God. Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, if you've heard of him, he was a monk and he had very little uh, responsibilities at his monastery. His job was to wash the bottles before they brew, uh, bottled the beer. And his job, well, another job was to answer the door. Um, the other job was to sweep the floor. A very, very um, unimportant guy who was assigned a bunch of unimportant tasks. But his fellow brothers, fellow monks, recognized something remarkable about, mar remarkable about his life. It seemed like every moment mattered to Brother Lawrence. That every moment he was present in that moment. That everywhere he, everything he was doing, everywhere he was, that's the thing he wanted to be doing. That's where he wanted to be. And so they had asked him, they asked him to write down a number of, the, how did you get to this point? And he talked this thing about the practice of the presence of God. He would practice the presence of God. And he'd recognize that wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, God is there. Whatever, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, God is there. See, so many of us, we spend so much of our lives either longing for the past. Remember Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite? Okay. That, that, in this case, it's the wrong audience. But there was this movie <laughs> in the 2000s called, anyways, like that, that kind of idea of like, you know, the person who longs for high school. We either spend so much of our lives longing for the past or regretting the past. Or we spend so, many of our, so much of our lives looking forward to the future, or fearing the future. In any given moment, we can be longing or regretting the past, or looking forward to or fearing the future. Planning for the future, excited for the future, nervous for the future, afraid of the future. And yet, the only time we actually have is this moment. That God is not in the past. God is not in the future. He's only here right now. Okay, theologically speaking, God is at all times and all presence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not in the future and you're not in the past. What you and I have is the only time we have to love God is right this moment. 
So Brother Lawrence discovered this, practice of the presence of God, which is any time I feel I wish I could be somewhere else doing something else, I realize, no, no, there is in some ways nowhere else. And there is nothing other than this. But God is here. And if this is where I know I'm supposed to be, then there is nowhere else I'd rather be. And yet every single one of us is plagued by this, this desire to be somewhere else and to be doing something else. And that's nothing new. This is kind of the last thing. We're coming to like the last little chunk. If you experience this, you are, it's, not your, it's not exclusive to you. In fact, this is one of the most um, ubiquitous. It's one of the most universal of the, of the seven deadly sins. So we got the seven deadly sins from the, the early desert fathers and mothers, right? They, the, that Christianity uh, grew up underground, and then when it became legal to be a Christian, there were some who thought, like, in order to be a serious Christian, I have to go into the wilderness. So the rise of the monasteries, or at least hermits. And when these men and women went into the desert, that's where they started categorizing, here's all the sins that um, attack my heart. So we have gluttony, and we have lust, and we have anger, vengeance, that kind of thing, like, you know, the movie, Luke Brad Pitt. Um, <laughs> and they said, they said, you know, not any one of the desert people, desert monks or desert uh, nuns, you know, religious sisters or brothers, experience all of, the, all of the, the temptations. But there's one temptation that every single person experiences. We don't all experience a temptation to wrath. We don't all experience a temptation to greed. We don't all experience a temptation to envy or lust. But they said we all experience the temptation to acedia. Now, acedia is another word for it is sloth. Which I like to pronounce sloth because I sound more <laughs> couth. As opposed to the people who say sloth, and that sounds uncouth. Um, so instead to split the difference, we'll call it acedia. And when we hear the word acedia, a lot of times people think of, like, laziness. But even from the very beginning, the people who described acedia said, no, that's not laziness. The person who's, who has acedia or gives into acedia, the person who gives into sloth, isn't a lazy person. They're experiencing something else. They could be very, very busy. And that's actually the problem. If this is you, let me just kind of diagnose something. They called Asidia the noonday devil, and the reason they called it the noonday devil was because here you are, you're a desert uh, prayer, and you live in your little hut. You got up in the early cool of the morning, and you did all your prayers, and now what your job is, is to, for the rest of the day, is, is to sit in your hut and pray, to sit in your hut and just be there and be present to God, to practice the presence of God just in this place. And they said that from 10 o'clock until 2 o'clock, right in the middle of the day, right, when the sun is super hot, it seems like it's not going anywhere. It's just like creeping so slow that you can't tell that it's even moving. In that moment, they said, if you are out there in the, in the wilderness, you're out there in the desert, that's when you think of all the things you could be doing other than sitting in your hut and praying. That's when you have all your great ideas. Like, I should write a book. <laughs> I'll be great. I should, you know, I, should, I shouldn't be in my hut. I should go into the village and help somebody. Um, I should be doing something else. And I should be somewhere else. This is where I'm supposed to be. Remember that decision, that distraction is anything that takes you away from what you should be doing. This is where I'm supposed to be. But I have this massive temptation to be somewhere else and do something else. The noonday devil. Why? Because the excitement of the morning's burned off. The, the cool and the rest and the one meal of the day, the rest of the end of the day, is, not, is so far off. And right now I have to just sit here and do this. It's one of the reasons why acedia is the sin or is the temptation that every person who's experienced a midlife crisis is going through. That's really what it's, that's what a midlife crisis is all about. It's acedia. It's nothing else. It's not, it's not like, well, he looked up to this, you know, younger girl. It must be lust. It's not lust. It's acedia. There they are. They got that fancy car. They quit their job and jumped, jumped ship to something else. That's not greed necessarily. It's not envy. It's acedia. Why? Because, well, I started my life out, and I was very excited, and I got this relationship. You know, we have a family, and I got this new job, and it's exciting. The excitement is gone. <laughs> if you got in church ministry, you're like, yeah, I work for the church now. And then day two, <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. And retirement is really long ways off. 
And what I just do is I just go, show up and I keep showing up and I keep showing up and I keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing. But at some point I get this in my, in my head, in my heart, just like the excitement is gone. The rest is not here. I should do something else. And I should be somewhere else. Now, if I can do that without breaking my commitments, if I can do that because that's where God is calling me, then that's not avoiding. That's not a distraction. That's where God's calling you. But how often are we trying to escape this present moment? Just because of acedia. The solution, of course, is to say, okay, God, this is where you are. Where I am is where you are. Doing this is what you're willing me to do. And so I'm going to make this a prayer. This is actually the last thing. I remember, um, I, I don't know if you've ever been really challenged by St. Paul saying, pray unceasingly. I'm like, ah, that sounds like a challenge. Um, it sounds impossible. But St. Francis de Sales came across this a couple years ago where he said, here's how you pray always. Here's how you pray unceasingly. And it's super simple. It's three parts. He has three words. You ask, you offer, and you accept. Some of you might already know this. I'll just remind, it, remind you of it then. You ask, you offer, and you accept. So in any given moment, wherever you are, doing whatever you're doing, you ask God to be present. Now, of course, God is already present because he's everywhere. But when we ask God to be present, what we're do, basically doing is saying, Lord, now I'm present to you. So we ask God to be present. Number two, we offer. Meaning we say, okay, God, whatever I'm doing right now is in my offering to you. I offer this to you as a sacrifice. I offer this to you as a gift. And third, we accept. God, I resolve to accept whatever comes out of this moment. Now, that is super simple. In fact, if we were to do this, to ask, offer, accept, to ask means every moment becomes a sacrament. Every moment, if you're, God, you're present, I'm present to you, every moment is a sacrament. Why? It's a, it's a channel of grace. If I offer any moment to God, every moment becomes a sacrifice. Every moment becomes an act of worship. And if I, if I resolve to accept whatever it is he gives me, every moment becomes an act of faith because I'm just trusting God that, yep, whatever happens this moment, it's yours. And I trust you. Now, I remember talking about this once um, on campus and this uh, woman came up to me afterwards and she said, Father, that sounds exhausting. Like to always be like, okay, ask, offer, accept, ask, offer, accept. It seems just like, I said, well, let me describe. This was the, the night mass on our Sunday. I described it at mass. And uh, I said, well, here's what I did today. Um, Today, I, I sat at some marriage preps, usually I have them on Sundays, and they, they canceled on me, so I had two things in my refrigerator, refrigerator. I had a steak and I had a can of beer. And so what I did was I said, Lord, be present to me <laughs> as I go out into our spring weather and sip on my beer and grill the steak. Lord, I offer to you as a sacrifice this moment of me grilling the steak and then eating it and then drinking this beer. And Lord, I resolve to accept whatever comes from this moment of grilling, eating the steak and drinking this beer. It wasn't exhausting at all. <laughs> but what it did was it made me think like this isn't just a random thing I'm doing. I was just going to grill some, some, some food. I'm just going to go drink this thing. It transformed a normal thing that we would typically distract ourselves from into a moment where God was completely present, and I was present to him, a moment where he was being worshipped by just living, and a moment where I was saying, God, I just trust you for everything. The last uh, quote I want to share is by uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori. It's a long quote, but I'm gonna, so I'm going to narrow it down. He said, there's two ways of separating ourselves from Almighty God. The, this, is, this is the end quote. <laughs> Two ways of losing your soul. <laughs> there are two ways of separating ourselves from Almighty God. You know the first, mortal sin. And voluntary distractions. Voluntary distractions subjectively interrupt or hinder our union from being as close as it ought to be. That when we... Speak, it should only be when it's preferable not to keep silence. Because the gospel does not merely say that we shall have to give an account for every evil word, but for every idle thought. Two ways to lose our souls. Mortal sin and voluntary distractions. And one way to keep our souls is to regularly practice the presence of God. 
and to be able to say at any given moment, Lord, in this moment, I ask you to be present. I offer you this moment. I trust you in this moment. Because in this moment, there is nowhere else I'd rather be and nothing else I'd rather be doing. All glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. He's remarkable and a gift. Um, I have pages of notes, but I wasn't tweeting because I felt called out, so <laughs> thanks for that. You can use the hashtag 2019 Matt Congress if you'd like to share your thoughts later. Um, Father Mike, everybody's going to want a picture with him. We all know that. He's going to be at the Word Among Us booth after this. He does have a flight to catch, so I'd go get in the line. But please don't stop him in here on his way out. He's going to head to the booth. But we're going to pray right now, so please don't rush over there just yet. There's a lot that he said that um, I think we can reflect on throughout the rest of our day. And, and the big one, I think, is we need to identify where we're distracted the most to recognize how we're being prevented by our own actions from being these prophetic disciples. So I would encourage us in our conversations at lunch and, and throughout the rest of the day to really ask yourself, where am I most distracted and what do I need to cut out in order to grow? Um, we're gonna take a moment to quiet ourselves. If you have your prayer cards, the Novena prayer cards that we've been praying. For those of you that are just joining us for today, there's these prayer cards in the back that we've been passing out all weekend long. Um, a nine-day series of prayers that we started a couple days ago, that's a novena, nine days of prayer, in anticipation of the summit on sexual abuse that is being held in uh, Rome in just a few days. And us joining our hearts and our minds to, to be able to pray for both healing and renewal in the life of the church. And so we're joined together in prayer. We encourage you to continue praying this novena after this conference ends. So just take a moment to quiet ourselves, to pull those prayer cards off. There will be stuff projected up on the screen if you don't have them. Share with your neighbor and let's enter into this time of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. And you shall renew the face of the earth. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. I then, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live in a manner worthy of the call you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another through love, striving to persevere the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, one body 
and one spirit, as you are also called to the one hope of your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Jesus promises a peace that the world cannot give. That peace should be the center of our relationships. Peace should reign in our pastoral staffs. Peace should be the strength of our families, of our parishes, of our world. Take a moment and extend to those around you the sign of the Lord's peace. Please join in singing with us on page 40 of your convention booklet. Hold on to love. Please join us on the refrains. There is a place for the sadness. Hold on to love. There is a season of gladness. Hold on to love When pain and confusion seem endless Hold on to love We cultivate healing through kindness Hold on to love where joy abounds hold on to love where grace and mercies overflow hold on to love when terror and fear Overwhelm us. Hold on to love. Courage and faith will sustain us. Hold on to love. When violence seeks to destroy us. of compassion restore us hold on to love where hope is found hold on to love where joy abounds hold on to love where grace and mercy Hatred is used to divide us. Hold on to love. Wisdom and truth reunite us. Hold on to love. When prejudice poses as freedom. Love where joy abounds. Oh. 
Let us pray. Breathe into me, Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may be holy. Move in me, Holy Spirit, that my work may be holy. Attract my heart, Holy Spirit, that I may love only what is holy. Strengthen me, Holy Spirit, that I may defend all that is holy. Protect me, Holy Spirit, that I may always be holy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Just a couple of very quick announcements. Um, the first is that if you have a prepaid ticket for lunch at the food truck, which is open, please write your name on your ticket to assist the food truck personnel people, um, legibly, of course. Um, and then for some of us, this conference is ending. This is like the, the last thing. Um, some people are staying, sticking around for the afternoon. Everybody's kind of in a different place. So for those that are leaving, we thank you so much for, for your presence here. For those that are continuing their day, we're excited for you. Um, my younger sister lives in Washington, D.C. She's a Canon Law student. And she told me a story not too long ago um, about how John Paul II, at the end of one of the, the canons, so one of those, those laws, and I think I've gotten this correctly, he scribbled at the bottom of one of the canons, which is a rule of the church, for the salvation of souls. And it struck me when she told me this story, because I've always thought of canon law, no offense, as this very boring thing, a bunch of rules and regulations that won't necessarily, hopefully, ever apply to me. Um, but that, that JP2 scribbled in, I think, what all of us need to be constantly reminded of. That the work we do, even the most menial task, the filing of the baptismal certificate record, all the, that's not menial, it's very important, but it sometimes seems menial, all the way to the, the, the heartfelt conversation with the person who's looking to convert, to the single mom that's struggling and doesn't know where God is in her life. Every moment of our ministry is for the salvation of souls, for the people of God. And I'm convinced, I know this is not necessarily theologically correct, but I'm not the canon law student, so I can say this. I'm convinced that heaven is going to be, when, those of us that work for the church, those of us that work in ministry, I'm convinced that when we get to heaven, if we get to heaven, fingers crossed, we'll stand at the gates for our eternity with the Lord and get to watch people come in and God will whisper to us, you helped with that one. Like that's the image I like to imagine, that that's what we're doing working for the salvation of these souls. So please, even if this conference is ending for you or, or if this is just the only day that you got to come, that you recognize the important work that you do, that this church doesn't, we are the church. It's not the church and us. We are the church and that, that your work is necessary. It's important. It's good. You're good at it. You matter. And we're grateful that you took the time to be with us this weekend. So write your name on your meal tickets. <laughs> Go get your picture with Father Mike Schmitz and remember how important you are. Thank you so much for being here. I baptize you in the name of the Father. I baptize you in the name of the Son. I baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Go out and spread the good. I send you out on a mission of love. I send you out on a mission of love. I send you out on a mission of love. And know that I am with you always until the end. Well, it's time for us to become people of spirit. It's time for us 
to become people of love. It's time for us to know that Jesus Christ is risen, forgives our sins, and brings us to life. I send you out on a mission of love. I send you out. Wow.